Well, I'd like to uh, baseball. welcome baseball all of you to our event this evening. Can you hear me okay? No. No. I'd like to welcome all of you to our event this evening. Uh, the event is uh, sponsored by the Journal of Educational Controversy, which is produced by Woodring. Uh, my name is Lorraine Casperson, and I'm the uh, editor of the journal. And it is also co-sponsored with the Center for Education, Equality, and uh, Diversity, or better known as SEED. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Kristen French. And also all of the staff from SEED uh, who really made this uh, possible. Speaker, Mr. Curtis Ocosta. Uh, he's been with us for two days and he's visited several classes, <coughs> he's uh, met with several groups. Uh, he's been, we really have kept him quite busy and uh, he has endured it all. So I, I want to thank you so much. Thank very you. grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you probably know, Mr. Ocosta is. Um, was a teacher in the Tucson School District for about 20 years. And he taught the highly acclaimed, very successful Mexican-American uh, curriculum there. Uh, and as you also probably know, uh, that curriculum was outlawed by the state legislature in uh, Arizona in a very highly politically charged uh, environment. Uh, it it sparked a nationwide debate over just which populations are represented and which voices are heard in the uh, public schools of this country. And it led us to put out an issue, which is going to come out toward the end of the year, uh, beginning of next year, uh, a special issue on the theme who defines the public in public education? Uh, as a matter of fact, what we're planning to do is um, we're going to have a uh, seminar in the spring and uh, once the issue is published and we'll invite all of you to come and join us and we'll have a discussion about uh, Curtis's article. So uh, keep it on your calendar and, uh, and watch out for it. Uh, Tonight, Mr. Ocosa is going to talk about, well, it's, he's actually going to talk about a topic that uh, we just discussed in our issue that's online right now. Uh, it's, uh, we did an issue, our current issue is the school to prison pipeline. And again, I invite all of you to take a look at our journal. We try to give you as broad a, a view as possible on, on these issues. Uh, Mr. Acosta is going to talk about the criminalization of Latino youth. And he's also going to offer us some ideas for a, an educational program and a pedagogy that can actually invite empowerment, resiliency, and, and hope. And so please join me in welcoming Curtis Acosta. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> wow, it's a uh, uh, big room, uh, pretty overwhelmed uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a lovely way. Uh, technically, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Lorraine. Thank you for uh, reaching out to me about uh, the journal because it was that conversation and the fact that uh, my, my good uh, compañero, Bill Bigelow, reached out to me about uh, speaking this Saturday at the uh, Northwest Teaching for Social Justice Conference in Seattle. Um, that I'm here because that we could hook this all up. So thank you so much for the honor and uh, privilege of writing for the journal and for spending, uh, for spending today. Kristen, thank you so much. And Vero for, for being able to, to, uh, to, to spend time with this amazing young people uh, you have in your classes. Man, I was blown away. 
Whew, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> man, I, seriously, I, this is not hyperbole. Um, uh, th th there's no doubt that I got the biggest mental workout ever from the deep questions that, that those, the, the classes and the youth here uh, and, and, and from last night too, uh, uh, the, the teachers uh, and, 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 the, and the professionals that are on their way to become teachers. Uh, I mean, I've been, woo, I've been working out. So let's hope this like, uh, I'm not a total like drooling idiot at this point. Because uh, technically I've only been here for a, a, a day. So, because uh, I mean, I came here, you know, this is like 24 hours. I was just here last night in Kristen's class and they were, we were, we were going at it. It was awesome and uh, it's beautiful. So I don't have a remote, but we're just gonna like just go with it. So I'm gonna have to hide behind this once in a while and things like that. So just, just go with me. Uh, and, and whatnot. So thank God I spelled things right. I think that's true. Um, <laughs> um, but this is the way I start. Um, and it, it, uh, I, I, one day I hope to, to actually walk around your campus and your, your town here because it looks beautiful. But I've been inside all day. And that sucks because I, in, the, in the contract I demanded uh, uh, the sunny days and good weather. <laughs> and, and they delivered. And of course, apparently you all got to enjoy that part. And I got to just know that I just, I just didn't have to pack a raincoat. Uh, I'm mocking Washington just by that whole very fact. Um, anyway, it's an honor to be here tonight. And, uh, and, and so I'm going to kick this off, just get the show on the road. This is brand new stuff that I'm putting together. Um, and I'm going to try to stay there. Thank you for sacrificing watching your, uh, your little professional football team that you have up here. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm a little disappointed that you're here because that's good karma for your squad and bad for me as a Bay Area native. Because uh, I want nothing but the death and destruction today uh, <laughs> down in the desert. And Phoenix isn't my favorite place either for a lot of reasons. Uh, and that's where your squad is. So ordinarily, if, uh, if you weren't so damn good, I'd be, uh, I'd be uh, uh, excited for you to go and give some humble pie to those people. Uh, <laughs> interest convergence theory, Derek Bell, though. Th that doesn't work anymore. You're too good. Uh, but anything, thank you for sacrificing the football game. And, and those of you that are transplants from the East Coast and Detroit and Boston, I guess you got a little baseball game going on. But since my Giants, who are still world champions at this moment, are not in the playoffs, then uh, we're just going to ignore all that. <laughs> all right, so that's enough of the jokes. All right, now we're going to get busy. So this is how I would start my classrooms every day. And what you see right here is an, uh, uh, um, a Mayan principle. All right, so the Maya, for those of you that don't know uh, or need a little refresher, um, uh, if you, you know, Cancun, dude, you know, or spring break for all you young people. Yeah. <laughs> well, way back in the day, uh, Cancun uh, was filled with, uh, with people who, uh, who uh, didn't just work in hotels uh, and, uh, and whatnot. That they, they would live there in that beautiful, and that, seriously, you gotta, you gotta go to the Yucatan. It's, it's gorgeous. And uh, Chichen Itza, obviously, is, is in the Yucatan. Oh, no, obviously, it's a... It's a, a, a Mayan pyramids. It's a gorgeous spot. You can still, you can't climb the pyramids anymore. I made it just under the time, the timeline where they cut that off because of the wear and tear. But because um, I got to climb them, um, and so, uh, but uh, but it, it's inspiring to see that. And and that this right here, this concept, this principle is is from there, right? Um, how many of you were born in North America? Okay, all right. Uh, okay, how many of you were born uh, on planet Earth? Okay, okay, like good representation from those two, uh, <laughs> those two places. So this is your history. This is your history. So I invite you, if you enjoy this, to, to, to claim it. You know, not to colonize it, but to enjoy it. And, those are, and, and it's, this is West Side, y'all. <laughs> Western Hemisphere, too. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, it literally means what Luis Valdez, and if you don't know who Luis Valdez is, I'll let you Google that. Um, you ordinarily, I, I got too much to talk about tonight. But, um, but Luis Valdez is one of our greatest playwrights in the history of this country. He is a founding member of Teatro Campesino, which is really tied to the United Farm Workers Movement and that history. And he's an unbelievable, fabulous man and literary giant. And he penned these words. And that's what 
in la cache means, all right? Tu eres mi otro yo, you are mad at me. So what we're going to do is participate in the beginning of class. Because that's, no, this isn't really class, this is me talking at you, and that's not critical pedagogy. Um, that's, I don't know, you know, so hopefully you'll find it valuable in some sense. But I'm, I'm just gonna like, uh, there, yeah, I got something to say, so I mean, you're here, so let's, let, right, let's do it. But, um, so what we do is we start with the unity clap, all right, right, no, no, don't do it yet, don't do it yet. <laughs> All right, and then we add another element to it, right? Which is the, uh, uh, everybody say the following, if you want, say the following, Isang Bagsak. So I learned Isang Bagsak from my Filipina brothers and sisters in the Bay, all right? <laughs> all right, yeah. So what we, they do, they do the unity clap in their, in their ethnic studies pro, classes at, in, in San Francisco. And, and, and then they added Isang Bagsak, which means one down in Tagalog, all right? And one down in the movement sense, like one thing accomplished, all right? So now the way it works is we do the unity clap, right? And as it gets faster and faster, somebody, it's gonna be me this time, unless I have one of my Filipino brothers and sisters wanna take over for me, that's fine. Uh, are you sure? All right, just check. <laughs> but from now on, you're gonna do this, right? You're gonna take over. So, so anyway, uh, uh, I'll yell out, Isan Baksak! And then we're all gonna do something in unison. So you can clap at that moment, stomp, or a grito, a shout. Like, woo! That's something like that, right? Now you gotta decide. We're not gonna sit here and go, okay, how many gritos? Grito? <laughs> I believe it. I, I'm a firm believer in democracy, but not now. All right, so, and it's full circle because the United Farm Worker Movement, La Raza Chicanos, right? Mexicanos. Mexicanos were part of that movement, and so were Filipina Filipinos, right? Those were the two. So to bring a unity clap with Isang Baksak, and then to go all the way back to the west side here in our indigenous knowledge, that we're hitting a lot of things. And then you got English and Spanish. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to do that unity clap, Isang Baksak, right? One whole, one clap in unison. And I rate my audiences, <laughs> and you don't want to be at the bottom, because that's the only people I talk about. All right? That's Denver, Colorado right now. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about, those of you that are in class today. But anyways, it wasn't fair. Yeah, she, if you're from Califas anyway, so it really, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's really on us. Thanks a lot. All right, so we're going to be sock, boom, right? And then we're going to read it in that catch, if you want. I learned this from one of my students a long time. Get in where you fit in. If this ain't your style, then you don't have to do it. All right, but if you want to jump in, that's beautiful too. All right, so okay, are you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. That's good. You got metal off the hook. <laughs> and not like it's off the hook, like off the hook. <laughs> all right. So usually what I did in the classroom is I would say in la cash, and then we would all start with tu eres mi otro yo. So before we do that, I'll get, get the words in your mouth. In. Oh, yeah, you can do the thing. I would just do one. In. In. La. La. Esh. Esh. Now we do it all together, and you kind of squish it. In la cash. Okay, well, there you go. Now, I'm the only one saying that one. You're going to jump in at tu eres mi otro yo, all right? Now, some of y'all are really good Spanish speakers. You need to be sensitive. Because there's going to be some folks that are trying it out. So we're going to kind of go with the flow. Now, some of you are really good English, spe English speakers. Unlike me. Right there. Probably throughout this presentation. So you're going to have to go with the flow there. You've got to keep everyone in mind. Because like we just did with the unity clap, we've got to keep this unified. So listen to one another. And I would do that in the classroom. I'd be like this. If they were all going at different paces, I'd be like pulling my ear, telling somebody to steal. <laughs> yeah, see? There's going to be a lot of sports today, by the way. So. All right. So ready? I'm going to say in my case, and we're all going to jump in this too, and we're going to start reading it together, if you want. All right. In la cash. Tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. Si te hago daño a ti, if I do harm to you, me hago daño a mí mismo, I do harm to myself. Si te amo y respeto, 
If I love and respect you, may I be respectful yo. I love and respect myself. Isn't that a nice way to start? That's how we started school. Every day in my classes till they were banned. Actually, after they banned, the kids still did. Because they could. I couldn't do jack. But they could do stuff. We figured that out real quick. <laughs> so, um, so we kept doing it like that. And that was beautiful of them. And the reason why I did this, usually I ask educators and teachers, I go, why do you think, why would I choose to start like this way? You know? And, uh, and, uh, but, but for today's purposes, I'm just going to jump to it. Uh, we needed to reframe the experience of what was going on in our classroom. I wanted them know, to know from the jump that we were going to talk about, that, we're, that our time together in that space to learn was going to be around the idea of loving one another. I wanted to be very overt about that. I also wanted them to be connected to their indigenous history. And it's your indigenous history too. Because like you raised your hand, right? And so sometimes we get caught up in flags and stuff like that, but it's not a World Cup year, so relax. <laughs> right? You can rock that next summer, right? When we're all watching our teams play in Brazil. I'm sorry, Panama. Uh, it didn't work out. So if there are any Panamanians here that are still bitter about Tuesday night, I feel you. That looked awful. But we're really talking about rehumanizing the space and resuscitating hope because Jeff Duncan Andrade, somebody I look up to, and he said something to me years ago. He said, uh, it, it, you're, it was just to me, even though there's a bunch of people like, with me in there, you know, well, listening to him. But I know he was just talking to me. He goes, when you start the class, the first day of school, he usually yells at you. I'm not going to do that. Uh, you know, he's, like, he's a pretty powerful young man. Anyway, he goes, uh, he said, you are a, 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 an official of the state. And what has the state done to, that, to, your, to the students in your classroom, to their communities, to their, to, to their families, generationally? You have to keep that in mind. So he goes, you must disrupt that from the jump. And so uh, this was an authentic way to disrupt that in the, in the way that I believe and my colleagues in Mexican American Studies believe we should view the world, which is to rehumanize the experience. Okay? So that's why we did it. That was the purpose. In the first day of class, I would like look into their eyes and just say it to them. I wouldn't do the whole thing I did with you. But I, people, like audiences, like to participate. You guys did. But the first day, I wanted to do that to them. So I was weird and strange, and, and I messed them up. So the Bato Locos, like, what are they? What's up? Right, that's what they like you. Otherwise, they're like, shh. You know, they got their cool jacket on. They think they're so bad. They come in and sit in the back of the class. <laughs> I may work for you, I may not. <laughs> you are, are in a job interview. You are, you're in a job interview at that moment. As a teacher, when I get flipped the script, now a lot of my colleagues would be like, oh, uh, uh, you gotta come to me. No, 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 he's got it right, I have to come to him. Because that whole persona that he's on, has there, it's to protect himself. Because the world has been nasty to him. And the cholitas también. And the quiet ones too. Right? They all got a different way of protecting themselves in that space because they know what's happened to them in the past. Or they know what happens to them in the community, on the street. They know. So they don't know me yet. They don't know you. So you better show them who you are. So I would do this. So I would do clap by myself. And then I would say this to them and they'd be like, who the hell is that dude? <laughs> right? And I would just rock the Vato Locos world for whole, like, probably a whole couple days. I, I, I imagine in my mind that, 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 they're, that they're sitting in their biology class going, that old man looked at me and said he loved me. And, and he, <laughs> <laughs> Luis, yeah, yeah, I'm here, I'm here. What the hell, what the hell just happened? The bell <laughs> right? Good, right, we want to do something. So anyway, that's a little bit of, of why, why we did it. And, and, and something to think about. And something to think about for the rest of this talk too. Um, so I thought, I'd show you a little bit about where I'm from, okay? So here you go. This is Arizona. Well, this was Arizona. <laughs> How do you play this thing? Uh, there's a video here, I swear. It was here earlier today. Oh, well, maybe it's not here anymore. That's too bad. It's a really cool framing device. 
I usually work with my own equipment, y'all. So you're just gonna have to. You're gonna have to. What, what you're gonna see. Uh, there's probably no way. I, there's no way I can figure this out. Does anybody know if there's any video on here? No, it doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna show you. It was a really cool framing device. What I was gonna show you is the U of A uh, introduction to the basketball team. Uh, no, I don't have it. Um, it's not my flash drive. But don't worry about it. It's just cute. Um, it's one of those sports montages, like right, where you see like all U of A does this whole thing. Like, but they use the framing device. This is Arizona, and at the very end, it's awesome because they have a siren. So I usually say thank you to the sports information department at the U of A for giving me a framing device for this talk. At least I do that in my rehearsal before I came here. <laughs> <laughs> and also to include the siren, because that is what it's like being in Arizona, the siren, right? And it's supposed to give you the dumb chills before the basketball team comes out. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, we're killed, right? And, but this is also Arizona, too. That's HB2281, that outlawed my classes. That's a lot of people excited about Joe Arpaio and SP1070. Yes, yes, see, we support Sheriff Joe. Right? If you don't know who Sheriff is, that's, that's um, Google. You can Google. And SB 1070, and that's who, like, you know, that's, that's our young ones, uh, you know, riding. So what we see is a criminalization of Latinos, Latinos and Chicanos. And I like that one right there at the police state. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways to, to, that, that artists were responding to this, right? In my state, Mexican American studies was bad. In my state, Papers, please, law, 1070, which, which means you can racially profile. You can just pull anyone over and go, are you a US citizen? Now, technically, you're not supposed to do that, police officer, but there's a law that, that'll protect them, pretty much. And what we're really talking about is right there. That's the dream nine from the summer. Now, here are these nine young people, you know, in, in mortarboard and gown, you know, cap and gown. This is who they are. This is, this is a criminal in our country and where I'm from. This is Arizona. How courageous these young people are to self-deport, to show what's, you know, to bring attention to our broken immigration policies, right? I mean, who, who has that courage? People ask me, how do you do it? How do you do that? How do you do that? What's even crazier is they're graduates. They're students. They're brilliant people who are nerds. Nerds are not safe. If you're a Mexicana, Mexicano, if, you're, if you don't have the privilege of having documentation, we have criminalized what you see right here. Ordinarily, in this country's history, we would see this as, a, as an un, unbelievable and valuable resource. We would want to tap into this potential. We would want to cultivate it and grow it and see it come back to us 10 times over. But right now, that's what a criminal looks like. And this is actually the law that, that was used, is passed to end our classes. Some of you have seen The Daily Show. I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm not going to show you any precious knowledge or anything like that. You, but you can drink in some of those, 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 those uh, vague way, those vague parameters about what is illegal. So you cannot, like, if you teach anything that makes folks resent, makes, makes students resent what, you know, another class of race of people, you're in trouble, right? Or advocating ethnic solidarity instead of the treatment of pupils as individuals. So it literally, in state law in Arizona, you must treat pupils as individuals. You must not see them as part of any type of collective, which makes the Pledge of Allegiance very, very troublesome. <laughs> or at least contradictory, hypocritical, or whatnot. This is a, this is a very vague law if you, want to read, if you want to teach British literature. Uh, if, if, if you want to, if you want to uh, root for the United States soccer team. This, this, that's ethnic solidarity. No, we're all just individual vessels. That's the what, we're, you know, you can be, you can lose your apportionment, 10%. That's what was threatened, $15 million. They didn't abolish our program. But this isn't just in Arizona, this is Georgia. You all know about Georgia? Check out Georgia, it looks a lot different, doesn't it? 
Like if I took out the little maps, would you think this was any different than what I showed you? It looks almost identical to the struggle that I showed you earlier. Right? Georgia's a long way from Arizona, but it is in the dirty south. We got the south in common. Southwest, dirty south. We have this issue going on. So I don't know if you're, if you're aware, but HB 87 banned undocumented students from attending the top five universities in the state. Can't go. Okay? Not you got to pay extra and all that other stuff that happens elsewhere. Can't go. So we're criminalizing the same type of students, right? I call it the hate child. You know, we used to have this thing called love child. Now it's like baby, baby daddy, baby mama. That's so less romantic. Love child, right? The generation before me had love children. We got like, What's that? that's my baby mama. What the hell is that? <laughs> it's kind of gross and seedy. <laughs> but a love child together. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. I'm a love child, right? No, I'm not really. <laughs> but anyways, what they took is this is a hate child of SB 1070 in my state, right? So let's get at the undocumented. But let's get at the students, too. How do we do that? I've got it. We'll ban the undocumented students, but are mostly Latinos. Yeah, excellent. And unfortunately for this young man, um, Reality caught up to him, and Georgia became Arizona. And this is Chicago. Looks a hell of a lot different, doesn't it? So Chicago, what you see right here is folks in the streets, again, protesting policies that are, in, that are, that are, being, uh, uh, that are affecting their community. In this case, the closure of those schools right there in highly impoverished African-American neighborhoods, right? 50 schools. And you see folks saying, support our schools, don't close them. And you see somebody like Karen Lewis, who had just successfully, the year before, been the leader of the teachers union that went on strike and won against Rahm Emanuel, and CPS, Chicago Public Schools. They had won. And they won because they had this connection between the community, the parents, the students, and the teachers. They were a solidarity together, just like they are here, right? And this is my homeboy, LaShawn. I met Karen Lewis this summer. I met LaShawn this summer when I was in Chicago. If you need to Google LaShawn and listen to what he has to say, all right? All right? And the kid's solid, too, because a lot of people will be like, a lot of people would be like, hey, uh, 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 he, he, was, he was coached to do that. I met the boy this summer. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> he could be, I wish he was president now. <laughs> He's keeping it real <laughs> and keeping it smart. And LaShawn, like, busted out this beautiful speech in front of this ginormous rally of parents, teachers, just like they did for the strike. School still closed. So well, all of a sudden what I was seeing is like, we did that to support our program. In a, in a, in a, we were a microcosm. I used to call Arizona the Petri dish of hate. Like we're gonna experiment here. Ooh, what can we get away with, right? And then you started seeing it spread. And what you saw spread was the deafness of policymakers and, and, and politicians and legislators and other p positions of power to the people, to students, youth to parents, to teachers, to community members. And a lot of times, there were folks of color. So you put that together with the criminalization of our youth, and we have a serious problem. Because this is America in 2013, y'all. I like this one, right? Because it shows this is you know, Alabama in this case, right? You know, this is the 50th anniversary of of the, of, of the March on Washington for Freedom and Jobs. We thought we were past this, didn't we? And this is a little map of how Arizona's Petri dish spread. Hey, we're safe. Did you, did you find yourself in there? I found you. I feel a whole lot better just being here looking at that map, knowing where I'm at right now. So thank you. But unfortunately, there's a lot more of that map that's colored. So what, what's going on in America right now? 
where we've seen this lesson before. We've seen it with Alabama schools in 63. Now we're seeing it at Alabama schools in the 2010s. And I thought I'd show us a little bit, give us a little bit more context. Salud, bless you. So the, Hugh, the Pew Hispanic Research Center just recently came out with, with a study, and you might have heard it over the summer, that Latino students are graduating at a higher clip than European American students from high school. Okay? Now that sounds good. And then I decided to scratch a little bit of that itch for this talk tonight. Now let's see what happens after that. Well, that's 2013 data. Here's 2010 data. This is as close as I can get from the same research center that's highly, highly recognized as you know, having one, some of the best researchers in, uh, in America. All right? And, and what you see here is the, the, uh, a breakdown of bachelor's degrees and associate degrees. So I'm going to stay with the bachelor degree numbers because that's what I remember because I can't see my notes because usually I use my phone. <laughs> but 1.4 million, no 1.2 million, excuse me, 1.2 million bachelor degrees were given to folks of European American descent. I know it says white up there, I can read. But I'm half of that and my mama ain't no color in a crayon box so I don't call her that. My mama's from Sweden. Well, not literally, like a couple generations ago. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I don't call my mama white. I call her Swedish. Cute little Swedish lady. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's just my hang up. You're going to have to live with it if you like to be called white. Oh. 1.4 million bachelor degrees for folks of European descent. 160,000 bachelor degrees in 2010 to folks of African American descent and 140,000 degrees, bachelor degrees, to folks of Latino descent, okay? So now we got a different question to start asking. We can, uh, as people pat themselves on the back nowadays all the time about post-racial this, post-racial that. You know, like, oh look, we're graduating more Latinos than, than European Americans, it's over, woo, ah! Except when you look at the next institution, and you're in one right now. You're, in one, you're sitting, and I'm speaking in one of these institutions right now. Now, I don't have the demographics or the numbers because I don't want to be a rude host. <laughs> you can do that with your professors on your own time, and you should. So there's something still going on here in, in this America. So if they're not going to college, where are they going? Here's one place. Okay. This is from the cage in... Uh, uh, the Cajun in America from the New, York, uh, the New Yorker magazine, okay? Adam Gottman, it's a great piece. Just these, these stats here. You can go ahead and just drink them in. So this is also what's going on in America. At the same time this is going on, states have decided to spend six more times in the last decade on the indust prison industrial complex than on education. And you know, Michelle Alexander, who did the new Jim Crow, she did this a lot better than me, a lot better than Adam Gopnik. There's, so there's something here we don't like to read or say too often, but those of you that listen to the Daily Show clip, you know I like to talk about it. Because at the end of the Daily Show clip that they did on our program, Michael Hicks, a school board member in TUSD, said, well, if there's no more, if there's not one white person left on the world, you can do what you want. And I love that clip because that's something we don't say very often, which is those first two words. Because we get all weirded out to talk about white supremacy. But that's what that is. When, when someone says, when there's not one person left, now you can do what you want. When I think we should have a better system than that, of working with one another. And then you see these laws here, and you see the imprisonment of what's going on. And then, you know, the smart folks in the room are also going, yeah, it's free labor. That's a neoliberal agenda. We'll get to that. But let's talk about this nexus. Let's talk about this convergence. So look at this uh, Golash Bosa study from UC Merced. I, I, I love the language of Ms. Foley's article. And this was from the Huffington Post. When she, because it's highlighted, check it out. So this is during a democratic president, so what are we talking about here? When, I mean, that's, those days, uh, hopefully you know, are over. Where like parties, you know, parties are like basketball teams now. 
you know, we, you just, you know, it's like you just root for them during the election, and then, but there, what, what, but it, it's, it's more, it's more, uh, it's more symbolic than anything else. Now, it's not real. So this is under our president currently, right now, four hundred thousand removals. I love that word, removals, like like a cancerous tumor. It's not deported because that that almost puts even more of a like human face on it. But removal, like something you have to take off of your of your body. Like a, that skin cancer, fry it off. So we got to get remove these bodies. And while they go through this removal process, where do they go? Where do they go? Prison. So now you see how we all got to crack a lacking. Right? And we, you don't need me to put it together because the Corrections Corporation of America in their annual report, they're just going to straight up tell you. That's how arrogant and brazen these folks are. Check out that language. It's a billion dollar industry. They know it. What we're talking about now are bodies. We're not talking about selling soap here or Kit Kats. I'm a big M&M's fan. How do we increase our profits? Well, Let's have one day where we have all nothing but green M&Ms during single day mile and we'll do it again for St. Patrick's Day. We'll get both markets. That's a great idea. All right, let's do it. All right. All right. Green, yeah, green's in. Yeah. Oh, everybody wants green M&Ms or something like that, right? No, this profits, right? We're talking about bodies in cages. They decide how, in our state, they decide how to build prisons off of second graders test scores on standardized testing. So we see this convergence. But don't worry, it's not going to get too like depressing. I thought I'd show us something. Yeah, because this is getting dark in here. Now, it's important to have that map there right after the first picture. Because that map shows us that we got a long way to go. So I don't want anybody who's an advocate of LGBTQ people to go, hey, don't be painting that rosy picture when there's a long way to go. I know there's a long way to go. I'm, I'm keeping it real. But don't you like these images? They make us feel better. Because we know what's been going on lately with the Supreme Court and the Defense of Marriage Act. And if you don't know what's going on, there's been some victories for justice. There's been some victories for human rights and dignity. And if you don't think it's over, well, Time Magazine does. So take it, take that. Right? Gay marriage already won. So in 2013, we got something to hold our hats on. Woo! Thank God. It was getting kind of dark in here. All right? So we got to revel in that a little bit. One of the things I was most proud of in my band curriculum is that I overtly wanted to address this issue in my classroom. So I went and found queer literature. I went and found different ways to represent another oppressed group, another counter-narrative, to use the term, uh, to use the term of, uh, of, of uh, critical race theory, right? Another group that has found themselves in the yoke of oppression, another group that has found themselves silenced and marginalized, and I wanted them to know that if we're going to walk this in La Keshe talk, right, it's not just a cool little clap we do in the morning, and it's real. And that we have to investigate, especially Chicanos, Mexicanos, Latinos, we got some issues with this in our community. Yeah, we're the only ones, by the way. <laughs> but I think what can be powerful about ethnic study spaces is we can have these, these, these spaces for us to look at our own caca. That's a, that's a technical term. <laughs> Told you, I'm a doc student. You saw that. We have to look at our own caca. <laughs> what did you learn at the Acosta talk? We have to look at our own caca. <laughs> Orale. All right? So I was proud of that. As they reconstituted the program, built the new program upon our grave, and to be honest, it needed to happen anyways, no matter how I, what personal feelings I have for that. There needs to be something for our kids in Tucson. I have two of them, so I want them to have that opportunity. But this piece is missing. There's two pieces that are really missing when I looked over that curriculum. The youth piece and this piece. And, this, and if this piece is missing, you are out of joint with what's going on in this country. Because after all, you know, I'm in Seattle, right? I don't know if this will work here, but we'll see. Yeah, you're supposed to, you know what you're supposed to hear right now? A little Macklemore. 
Yeah, no freedom to the eagle. Damn, damn right, I support it. I want to make sure I did that right. No, that I, I sometimes I, I insert cussing. <laughs> so we're going to do this a cappella because we were supposed to sing this together. So we're going to do the hook. Now, more directions from me. I'm sorry. I'm that kind of director, stage manager, all that. We're going to sing, I can't change. <laughs> we are? Even if I try. Even if I wanted to. What is it? Oh, hey, there we go. But you all have to switch your gender. So I'll be saying he keeps me warm. And you choose what you're going to say. But you have to like keep it real with what we just did. So you ready? I can't change. Even if I try. Even if I wanted to. My love, my love, my love, he keeps me warm. He keeps me warm. He keeps me warm. That's not nice. <laughs> Maybe I don't need Michael Moore. <laughs> but that's your funds of knowledge. That's keeping it real up here in the Northwest. But this is also 2013. That's Trayvon Martin. That's the man who murdered him in Trayvon's disfigured body after the murder. And this one will hurt. That's Trayvon and his dad. I have, uh, I have two sons, eight and two. Whew. That hits. So when this verdict came down this summer, I was in Chicago. I was hanging with my, uh, my friend Gary Young, who writes for The Guardian. I just happened to be like homies with him because I work with his wife in the Education for Liberation Network. If you haven't read Gary Young's work, woo, you're missing out. Read my friend Gary's work. He's got a new book out right now called The Speech, about Dr. King's speech. So Gary said, wow, Curtis, he's, got a, he's, he's from London, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> he goes, the verdict's in. I was at a conference and I was getting ready the next day for Ethnic Studies National Assembly and I was where everybody should be right before that at a Kinko's or a Office Mass Staples. It was a Staples <laughs> in the north side of Chicago and, and, and Gary and I were just chilling there and he's like, man, really? We're supposed to be at a party right now, man, enjoying the conference. I'm like, sorry, I gotta get this work done. And he's like, the verdict came in. I go, what is it? He goes, Curtis. All right, okay, I'm gonna try. <laughs> the verdict came in. I'm like, oh yeah, the verdict comes, they say the verdict comes in and then they come in. Yeah, okay, there's some time. So Gary and I were, he was driving back to the L so I could get back to my, to my youth who were running around Chicago freely and that's not, you know, that's like, that's kind of, a, no, they were, they had some chaperones. <laughs> they were 15 to 21, so come on, you know, relax. And, uh, and I, on the L, I was, I was like f refreshing the phone right now to find, you find out what's going on. But on the way it's back to the L, Gary said to me, he goes, you know, Curtis, if this comes back in the way that we dread, it's permission to hunt black boys. That's what that is. And I go, well, what's your neighbor going to do if that happens? He goes, it'll be interesting. And so that's how we took that verdict, a lot of us. Trayvon and his dad won't have that moment again, nor will Trayvon's dad have that moment Trayvon's own children, nor Trayvon with his children. And those of you that are a little bit older in the struggle, you got some canas in the beard or the hair, especially those of you that have been advocating African American community for a while, this looks too damn familiar, doesn't it? And it's 2013. This is Emmett Till. This is Billie Holiday singing Strange Fruit. And I honor those folks. Those are, the, those are the backs and shoulders I stand on today that gave me the opportunity to be here. Those folks that stood up to that way back in the day, generations ago. And here we are in 2013. And this is also 2013. Look at that. I mean, we want that to be innocuous. But is it? Is Chief Wahoo, why is he still hanging around? And, and even, even stranger, sorry, wrong way. Why are people defending 
this so much? Why are we, in 2013, hunkering in to defend that caricature of my brothers and sisters whose land we're on today? And you know about this one, right? Oh, yeah. Our president even got something to say about this. And so does Daniel Snyder, the owner. Now, this is a little dated, man. This thing, this thing is moving so fluidly right now that I couldn't even update this with Daniel Snyder's latest letter. This is because I wanted to be prepared ahead of time for you all. So I listen to sports talk. Oh, sorry, my bad. I'm a little ahead of myself. So, so this is 2013, but check this out. This is the basketball team I love and support. This is where they came from. That's Philadelphia. You know, I'm from the Bay. I already told you that. I outed myself. And when the, they, when the Warriors first moved to, to San Francisco, they still rocked this, all right, 1970. And then, in 1970, they decided to look like this, and like this. That one, last one there was all over my peachy folders, or binders for you all. Uh, <laughs> well, binders were these, six, never mind. <laughs> I used to draw this all over instead of listening to the chemistry lecture. So I wanted to play for the Warriors. Had no idea about the roots of this. But that was 1970 in the Bay Area. And so was that. Did you know about Stanford? You did? Patricio knows. He's an alum. 1972, that went away. Look, there's a death date to that imagery. And look at that imagery. Damn. So how come in 1970 this is happening? Right? In 2013, we're hunkering down. Right? So what did Stanford do? They did, well, I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> <laughs> That's Patricio, he's over there. Maybe there's other Stanford they can like sit down and give you like a five minute talk about the hell smart kids in the Bay Area are doing like. <laughs> Like that, Jack. And I know, man, I know there's a tree on that S, so it's not like, because I grew up there, I know that stuff, but still, what? Really? Really? Oh my God. So I like listening to sports talk, because I think it gives me, uh, number one, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, this is a part of the way I was raised and love and, and see the world. But also, it's a great way to tap into uh, males uh, from 30 to 50, like, you know, the mainstream men, and specifically those of European descent. White boys love sports talk. <laughs> and they, and they, they market it. And you know, I do too. So, you know, I'm half white boy, so that's all right. Well, I'm actually a half white girl, to be technical. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bill Simmons, I love this because I love the first phrase. I like Bill Simmons a lot. I don't think Bill Simmons is racist, but he really said it's tough for me because I'm a white guy. I love that. Oh, man, it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Nah, it's out of context. That's unfair. <laughs> but look what he's doing here. It's pretty cool. Now, Yaki was the owner that was resisting segregation. I'm sorry, integration. He was, he was a segre seg ah, segregationist still. He was the owner of the Red Sox. He was resisting integration of the, whites, the Red Sox. All right? Now, a lot of people said he was doing that simply because the community couldn't handle it. There's different... Theories of why Yaki did that. He's a businessman. That kind of fits. Like, ooh, they don't want that. They, you know, they ain't, that's not happening. But he, what he's doing here is very interesting. And Dave Zirin is who he's having a conversation with. And I love this, because I'm on my bike listening to this over the summer. And I'm like, all of a sudden, you're not listening to people talk about sports, talk about this whole Washington professional football team name controversy. And then you see something like the end here. Or if I had to go, oh, I'm sorry, oh yeah, or if I had to go up to, def, to a Native American person and defend it, how would I explain it to them that a team called the Redskins is okay? I think that sort of like basic empathy is critical when you have these discussions. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> basic empathy is on my sports talk conversation right now. I was so excited, couldn't wait to go home. I looked, I like almost wrecked on my bike to see where the iPod was at that moment to make sure I came and transcribed because I was thinking of you all. And then Bill says this, yeah, right? You can go ahead and read it. And then in the worst transition I could ever imagine, he says, the Olympics argument is much more interesting. 
So what he's referring to is the argument around the Russian, the Russian laws and, you know, homophobic laws. But why do you have to frame it that it's more interesting than racism? Like, what happened to that whole idea of an injustice for one is an injustice for all? And he's certainly not listening to Dave Zirin. Dave Zirin wouldn't have said that because that lacks basic empathy. Now, why is it? Why do you think we have this progressive moment about LGBTQ community right now in this country? But we're, and, 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 and it's interesting. It's sexy to like somebody like Bill Simmons who represents this real mainstream kind of world, right? <laughs> And I think it might have something to do very, very plainly with the fact that we have people in our families, those of us who have European descent, those of us that are Chicano descent, those of us African American descent, Native descent, that are gay. But we aren't, don't all have somebody who's black, Mexican, Native in our families. So maybe that basic empathy is still connected to something. It's just conjecture. But we have to think about it for a minute. Why are we digging in for Chief Wahoo and the Washington Redskins? Why is Trayvon Martin still happening? Why are we criminalizing scholars? So I went to one of my, I, you know, like Foucault would have called this like, you know, there's no such thing as history moving linearly, dude, you're dumb. This is just all random stuff. There isn't, we're not going to something. That's what Foucault said. That's kind of depressing to me. I kind of like to think of that. 50 years after King, how could we be here? King told us this, right? Like Foucault was like, no, no, no. It's just random, brother. It's just random. Somewhere right now, some woman's being treated like a cave person, being dragged by her hair and abused. And that's not progressive either. So I went back to another scholar who said this. This ain't just neoliberalism. This is racism. Esa, ese. Yeah, I said that. Just <laughs> <laughs> Who I'm a scholar, man. I was trained well. You cite your sources. Some of you guys are going to tag this up. I'm going to be happy. Send me the pictures. I have a lot of friends in the social justice activism education movement and in the activism world, you know, for social justice across the board, Tambien, right? But a lot of times they want to talk about neoliberal agenda. A lot of times they want to talk about, they want to talk about like how this is all about that free market and this, that, and the other thing. I, neoliberalism did not kill MAS, okay? Neoliberalism isn't what we were looking at right there with the Washington football team. And so, even though there's a bunch of dots on this thing, because this looks really pretty on my, my Mac, by the way. <laughs> so what's up with this? Where is in Lakesh, where is the cross ethnic empathy? So Bill Simmons doesn't say what he said. Where was it? It was, you know, 50 years ago, it was SNCC, right? It was the Freedom Riders. Where were the buses going to Georgia? What was the response to Trayvon? Everybody's really proud that there was no riots. Really? Wow. I mean, I understand what I just said there. I'm not looking for that, but where was the outrage? There was a lot of complimentary, complimentary language of how well we were taking it. Huh. Where is the in Lakesh? Where is it nowadays in 2013? Now that's your and my responsibility if we believe this, to ask that question and just be about the transformation of that. Because this is what MAS was about. It's not about a neoliberal attack on education in this case. Right? They even got the real like scholarly folks to come and do regression models. This, this is from actually the the desegregation case, sorry, the desegregation order that six months after killing our program mandated a TUSD have culturally relevant curriculum. That's odd. 
You just killed one of the most effective ones in the history of our state and possibly the nation for Latino students. This is what we were doing. And these are my compañeros. And I always like to keep them around and close during talks like this. Because those are the folks that sued the state of Arizona that said, this is not right. This is not just. You cannot close something down that is based upon love and critical thinking and it's counterintuitive to all your models simply because you don't like the changing demographics or you're getting uncomfortable with the powers, uh, the, 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 your perception that power is going to change and that there might be some punishment coming back your way because you've been punishing folks for generations and this, that, and the other thing. We haven't yet found that cross-cultural empathy to understand each other and to believe like the Maya had said within La Kesh. We we're not there yet and we don't trust it. So we're gonna, before you get power, we'll put you back somewhere where you're gonna be a little less dangerous because we can't have you civically engaged. We can't have you going and practicing democracy and being critical Democrats, lo lowercase d in case anybody gets sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So why did we have to go? We talk about data all the time. Results oriented, right? Data driven, bull. Didn't save us a lick. Neither did the reality that we love people. That didn't save it either. Neither did the reality that you could come talk to our students and know exactly who they were and how they roll and whether they were really down for in cash or not. So what are we really talking about? Ah, oh, you think I'll leave you out. That's my boy, Jesse. You know Jesse Hapogian? I can't say it right, was it? Hagopian. I see I did the dyslexia thing with his name all the time. That's Garfield, right? Yeah, oh, look at that. Scrap the mat. You know, this is standing up to tests, right? Because tests, I told you, they feed into that whole prison industrial pipeline. And so Jesse and, and the homies at, at Garfield and folks here in the Northwest in Seattle stood up to, you know, ya basta, enough with these standardized tests, we're not going to take this one. Powerful stuff. Because after all, if data is not really what it is, it is if we're not going to look at it objectively, if we're not going to apply it evenly across the board, if we're, if we're actually going to, if we're going to actually like, uh, only use it selectively, then what the heck are we doing? When I first started teaching, we had four test days a year, maybe, right? And I think last year there was like 16, which was great for my doctoral work because I was getting paid to watch kids bubble in answers. But I certainly wasn't teaching. And they certainly weren't involved in anything too critical. Not like they would be if, I, if, if we weren't administering the PSAT, SAT, AIMS three times a year, right? Benchmark assessments so that we're doing well enough in, in a, as a district so that we'll do well on the state's AIMS test, the Arizona Instrument to Measure Standards. They used to make a joke back in the day. Arizona Instrument, Arizona Instrument to Measure Standards used to be called a teacher. <laughs> so we have people resisting, and that's what the rest of tonight is about. Now, I don't think you're going to be able to see this video, which is too bad, because this is the stuff this Vatos has to say. That's State Superintendent Hoopenthal, all right, in my state of Arizona. And you should, in this video clip that you can just pretend you're seeing, <laughs> he said, uh, he laid out the whole strategy to kill us. And I mean kill, because this is the language he was using. That's the first thing he says. As a conservative, he says, you can get defeated in your mission. And he started talking about Queen Bodica and the Romans. He's going to use a military analogy. That we knew we needed to do a professional job, he said. They killed everybody, slaughtered them. Even though they had more people and they were outmanned, the Romans stood up and slaughtered and killed everybody. So we looked at what Hannibal did to the Romans. So what did Hannibal do? We looked, over, we looked at conflicts over time. And during that time, you know, we stretched them out. 
And what happened is they lost students in their Mexican American studies classes. And then we delivered the knockout punch. We went over their curriculum, finite element by finite element. They never examined the teaching of our courses. They only looked at the books. So a big part of teaching is pedagogy. So when I was at Willamette University, I was asked to read part of Mein Kampf. Not because my teacher wanted to be, me to become a Nazi. <laughs> he wanted me to read what Nazis wrote. <laughs> so maybe I could be demystified from my obviously romantic notions towards wanting to be a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how they went after us. Not one teacher was ever put on the stand. Not even one teacher was talked to talk about how we applied things. So anything provocative was used against us. This is the eternal battle of all time, he says. Forces of collectivism versus the forces of individual liberty. The forces of collectivism are suffocating us. It's a tidal wave that is threatening our individual liberty. And drink all that in. That's who's running schools in Arizona. And who's he talking about? This is the army he's at war with. This is who's criminalized in my state. That space, that picture. Slaughtered, killed, eternal conflict. All that language towards that. Is that in Lakesh? Is that tu eres mi otro yo? Where's the outrage? Now you all had it up here, and I thank you for that. But we need to start looking at all the things that I was laying out. So I go, he says at the end, those are my philosophers, those are my guiding lights. So this is my guiding light. His is, his is Benjamin Franklin, my DJ Cool Herc. This is what Herc said in Jeff Chang's book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, which is one of the most beautiful definitive histories about hip hop that you could ever imagine. Herc says this in the introduction. This is who we're really about as people in this country, I believe. Check out. Now, Herc's talking, Herc's talking about the, you know, the, new, the new school. But really, I'm talking about these vatos right here. This power structure. Tom Horn, our attorney general. Dr. Mark Stegman, who was, our, who was a U of A professor and also the TUSD superintendent at the time, called me a cult leader. You know what I did? Why he called me? He, I was using cult techniques you participated in that same technique. I'm very good, aren't I? <laughs> because he was so scared in my room, he wasn't when he was there, but three months later when we called him out for his hypocrisy and some of his blatant racist tendencies, he all of a sudden thought that the chanting and the clapping was very scary. Now, he's Dr. Stegman, at the economics professor at the University of Arizona and the TUSD board president. If you want to look that up, it's in the Cowell Report. It's codified. It's state records that I'm a cult leader. Or, I, sorry, I use cult techniques. It's very spooky. John Hoopenthal, who you kind of did, got to hear, but not really, and Dr. John Pettacone, who was our superintendent at the time. So Herc's talking to them, too. Not just our young brothers out there like J. Cole, 2 Chains. <laughs> They need a talk, you know, Jake Holt, no, I like Jake, but Two Chains needs a talking to, and sometimes Kanye definitely needs a talking to. <laughs> Things went off the rails when mama passed away. <laughs> we need to figure something out for that brother. <laughs> Walked in the crib, got two kids, and my baby mama late. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> so I had to do what I had to do, because I had to get duh oh duh oh up all night, get my money right until the blue and white po 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 po. Now money coming slow because at least slow motion better than. Uh oh, uh oh. That's Kanye back in the day, y'all. <laughs> Talking about the hustle to feed his family because baby mama late. It ain't about keeping it real. And it's not just about putting our young brothers and sisters who are in these entertainment industries on blast all the time. Why isn't Tiger Woods doing this? Good question. Why isn't Jay-Z doing that? Another good question. Why isn't Beyonce doing this? Another good question. What about them? They're everywhere. What are they doing? 
Are they about keeping it real? Are they about even keeping it? They're not even about keeping it real, let alone keeping it right. Those folks right there are bad role models for our youth. And they're in charge of our youth. They killed our program. They have real power. And they're everywhere. So this is Arizona. What happens when you negotiate with terrorists? The folks that you just saw, the way they talk. This just came out, what? August 28th. So the new program and the new Mexican-American Studies program, there are no Mexican-American authors. This is what happens when you don't hold the line. This is what happens when you blink, when they come for you, when they bully you on the corner. You, those of you, that, you know, from the urban inner city and the streets, you understand this. You flinch, they on you. This is what happens, USD flinched, and now we have no, not only Mexican-American authors, no Latino authors at all in the Mexican-American Studies program. Of course, they got themselves embarrassed by this, and they've changed it since then. Thank God we keep embarrassing them. <laughs> this is Tony Diaz, El Libro traf Traficante. Tony put a bus together and did come to Tucson, and they smuggled in our banned books. He did, that in, uh, he did that in March of that same in 2012. We had boxes of boxes of books that we put to use, let me tell you. And you'll see that in a little bit. But I love this because look at what Tony said here. Warning, this post contains mind-altering thoughts of and in Arizona. <laughs> it's the ludicrous. We're living in this absurd world and time, aren't we? So this brings me to like Malcolm Gladwell and the idea of, uh, go ahead and give it a read. I was also listening, look, again, the BS report. Who knew? Bill Simmons could be dropping some knowledge. I love the fact, how, how, man, that's, that's subversive. You know, people are list, wanting to listen to like the latest like sports, you know, the, the football lines that they pick on Mondays. They also get to hear Malcolm Gladwell like, busting this knowledge. Now he's talking about industry. He's talking about newspapers dying. But I want you to take industry out of there once you're done reading. And I want you to insert the word institution. So institutions in decline get more conservative instead of more innovative. So let's look back at Arizona. What was innovative? What's banned? Same hand. What's conservative? Tests. What's flourishing? Tests. We know that crap doesn't work. It is not new. There's nothing there that supports it. And when you kick the test ass like our kids did, it still doesn't matter. So we know you're full of crap there too, whoever you are. <laughs> so, now this is really another one of my guiding lights. There's hope, folks, in the most regressive spots, there's still hope. And I think actually that's where we should find our inspiration. When things are the darkest, that's where you're going to find the springs of optimism. You know? Hope. This is Georgia. You know about Freedom U? So they banned. I told you about the ban, right? So three UGA professors said, I got something for you, ban. Ban this. We're going to start school on Sunday. We're going to teach for three hours. We're going to teach the same curriculum that we've been given in our classes. And we're going to do it in, in an undisclosed location where you don't know where we are, Jack. And we're going to teach those undocumented kids because ICE ain't going to come in here and blow this up. And they took the model of freedom school, right, from that, that fed into the civil rights movement, and they started Freedom University. And you know as soon as I stopped teaching at TUSD, which I stopped teaching at TUSD officially, uh, in August of, 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 of 2013, that in September 2013, my ass was there teaching. Because I owed those young scholars and those really smart, courageous young people who still, that, that's activism. And, I, and I'll tell you where I learned that in a second. That they're going, that's Matt Hicks too. Matt Hicks is one of the high school teachers in Athens, Georgia. And that's the class. And the reality is, I had to put those little boxes over their faces.
because that's where you and I live. Yeah, you can see the privilege. Right? You see Matt, you see me, and you see Miha, right? Dalia, she was very clear. I got my papers, Mr. Acosta. Just last month. You can go ahead, put that stuff on Twitter. <laughs> I wish I could show you the rest of their beautiful faces. Folks that are committed to hanging out on Sunday to deepen their knowledge. Not for any credit. Real school. That's dope. And you know why I had to go pay them back? Because they inspired me to do the same thing. So as soon as they shot me down, we met on Sundays. In Chicana, Chicano literature, art and social studies. Class. <laughs> we went to a local youth center. Did the same thing. Sacrificed some football games. Got my team to the Super Bowl. Should have had class on that Sunday. We would have won. Not doing it this year is good news for you. And those same students went to Chicago to break it down. All on their own. I said, hey, here's a proposal form for Free Minds Free People. If you want to go, you got to do it. I'll edit it, though, because I know you kind of check sometimes with your stuff. And they got accepted. And here they are at presenting in Chicago because they told me, you know what activism is, Mr. Acosta? Activism is what we were doing every Sunday. Because I said, what does activism mean to you now that class is over? Have you participated in any? That's how dumb I am. <laughs> One of my students, Esperanza, she's like, um, yeah, showing up at Sundays was activism, Mr. Acosta. <laughs> because that's banned in schools. You might, oh, yeah, you mean my whole life. Yeah, you're telling me my whole life. <laughs> That's why I told you, man. I, I was going to tell you where that came from, that idea. That is activism. So is going out and presenting, telling your story. And so is breaking it down at Radical PD. We have this PD right before the conference begins every year. And uh, they were so nervous because we didn't, I didn't prepare them. They were so like into their own presentation that I just decided to let Rad PD go. Because I know how good they are. We didn't need to practice. Well, we're just going to have a conversation. I'm like, OK. So that Sunday before, we're like having bagels and whatever they're eating. And, uh, and I'm like, all right, let's just talk it out a little bit before we get on the L and you go and drop knowledge. And they're like, <laughs> they're rocking it. Yeah, you see how, how uncomfortable they are. And you see how bored everyone is. They knew they were getting the root of the truth, the panche bay. It's a little another Mayan phrase for you. So this is Arizona. So I, a little bit. And the story got better. You can read a little bit right there. And that's all because of Freedom U. And that's in a space where they've criminalized my young people and myself, our indigenous knowledge, our cuentos, our history, who we are as human beings. You know, I have a theory that the reason they were so damn threatened is because it was mostly, not all, it was our classes were, were diverse, because anybody could take them. Um, in fact, my classes were more diverse than my freshman classes, which weren't Mexican American studies, because I, I'm in mostly a Chicano school. So the concentration of Latinos and in in, in Chicanos in my, in, my, in my freshman class was more than, because everybody wanted the dopeness, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Didn't matter who you were, you wanted some of that. <laughs> so, uh, so anyways, that whole idea, right, about, about um, now I forgot where I was going. <laughs> anyway, so, so class got, the, the story got better. We got, we got some free, free uh, college credit. Now, I had to make that, like, they, the Prescott College came back, and they told me, they said, hey, um, they're, they, were, they were always supportive of us. They're like, are you really doing what you th we think you're doing? I'm like, yeah. Why? Are you going to tell on me? Because you can't get me because I'm doing it at a community center. <laughs> uh, and they're like, they're like uh, no, no, we want to we see, would you be interested in giving, a, giving your kids college credit because we know that the, 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 the stuff's rigorous. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so I said, only if we keep it free, because just showing up on Sundays was free. So the spring semester, they said, we can't do free, but we can give you the mechanism to do so. So we passed the hat. 
we got it, we got over the line. All right? So in these spots where all this is happening, there's hope, resiliency. You can see it. Where this remains alive. Oh, that's what I was going to tell you. I was going to tell you that I think one of the reasons why they were so threatened is you had Chicano teachers who were in touch with their indigenada, their indigenous epistemologies, their indigenous wisdom. You had mostly Latino Chicano kids learning, being successful, learning their stuff, their history, their cuentos, right? Their art. All of a sudden, if you're threatened by that, because you're not a part of it. What do you mean? They can run schools without us? Better than us? They can run life without us? No, no, we got to stop that. So a little bit is those of you that study students of slavery, that mentality about like, no, you need to be dependent upon us. You can't do this by yourself. My God, what happens if all these brown folks and black folks and native folks Figure out they don't need us. It's a little separation anxiety. <laughs> Everybody needs to calm down and realize we're all part of the same globe. See, when you don't rock in La Quiche, sorry, Juno always takes a little while to come up. Come on, Juno. There you are. <laughs> so, so when you don't rock in La Quiche, and I don't think these dudes that wanted to shut us down rock in La Quiche, they don't believe in that. When you don't do that, then you get scared to be left out of things. Some of you right now might have not been handling some of the basic truths that are coming from, from this, and maybe some of my extempor extemporaneous opinions might not have been handling it, but I can tell you this right now, I can look in all your faces, no matter who you are or how you're vibing with me right now, and I tell you this, I love you. I got no problem with that. But I also have no problem telling the truth, analyzing this world and wanting to make it better. Because as Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk say in Critical Race Theory, an introduction, once you name discrimination, it can be combated and it can change a system of beliefs so that you and I can find our own common humanity. When, when I read that, I went in like cash. Delgado and Stefanczyk are talking about the same thing. So this stuff's still alive, even though it's banned. Because another thing was born, which is Chito. You know that big buffalo right there? As Sean R. say, some of you do, that's why you left. <laughs> that's Anita Fernandez. She's a professor at Chito, I'm uh, sorry, professor at Prescott. And she, these are the folks, and I don't have a picture of my homeboy Todd, but we've decided to start an institute for teaching and organizing. And the vision is one day to have a space where real professional development can happen because a lot of times you get in dope college of education programs, Right, where you learn this stuff and get cultivated, or some people go back to school like I did, but a lot of times you just show up to work every day and you get booty professional development. That isn't about the things I'm talking about, about rigorous education that's humanizing and healing. You can do that? Yeah. Hire me. <laughs> and then we want to give it away for free, too, because that's the kind of harlots we are. <laughs> Now I gotta go out there and find some folks that wanna invest in that, some foundations and grants or stuff like that, but that's the vision. So if you're a teacher of color or you're a teacher who work with students of color in similar context, that you can fly out to Tucson, we're gonna put on some PD for you, get you to understand what these, these, the, these culturally responsive techniques and community responsive techniques, and at the same time, teach you how to organize. Because after all, a dope parent conference night is organizing. That's why none of them are dope. Because <laughs> people don't know how to organize. You know what organizing is? Hi, how are you? I'm Curtis. We don't do that. Number one, my wife's a principal. She don't have time to do that because they have her doing this, you know? Step and fetch stuff all the time, right? Instead of doing what she should be doing, finally going and talking to the students, talking with the parents, talking with the teachers. She got to go to this meeting and that meeting because no one trusts her. And they certainly didn't trust us. And, but when they left us alone, we were kicking ass. So right now we're actively searching for, for businesses or foundations, like I said, all right? So if you know any, let me know. Because we're gonna roll this out again in the spring. 
right? Because but first we got to get our institutional feet underneath us, right? So I'm looking for all this type of stuff, and that's my job, you know. I, hi, I was in a movie. Hi, how you doing? Right? right? You know, I don't mind doing that hustle as long as it helps our gente, as long as it helps our students, as long as it helps our teachers who are on the grass ground, grassroots, right? The, the ground floor every day interacting with youth. Can I help you? I want to help you because that's the ultimate in vengeance to these haters. Is to, as my homeboy and compañero Jose says in the movie. Chinachi, plant the seed and let it grow. So let's plant the seed all over this nation and stick it to these educational reformers that are talking just about test scores all the time and data this and data that, when they ain't talking about humanity and the conditions of the community, what's really going on. Because if they were about that, they wouldn't do what they did in Chicago. They wouldn't do what they were doing in Georgia. They wouldn't do what they were doing in Tucson. And you can add all your cities to that too. So I got this idea. Homegirl said this? Nice. Eva Longoria, really? Yeah. So I got this plan. I want you to keep hitting up our website, chicanoinstitute.org, our Facebook page, probably better. I don't do Facebook, but I'm going to tell Todd about this when I get home. He's our organizer. He's, that's, his, that's where he put his 20 years in. So we're marrying these ideas together. And guess what? Those of us, you know, that in, some of you that know the indigenous epistemologies that, I, that we teach, the Nahui Olin and Inlakesh and stuff like that, Todd uses it in organizing. Woo! <laughs> so anyway, I haven't told Todd this yet, but I can't wait when I go home. I want to do like this national day where we all tweet or Facebook ever and go, hi, Miss Longoria. <laughs> really nice and respectfully, right? And then some of you vatos out there, don't be looking for no date. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need you to get like twisted right now. You homegirls either that go, you know, that, that ever, like your, your kind of speed too? You either. <laughs> Let's keep this professional. <laughs> you can deal with your crushes on your own time. I don't want to be heteronormative. I know a lot of us are uh, inspired. I want you to keep this buttoned up though. And we're gonna tweet her and we're gonna say, hey, we heard that you were really affected. It's still alive. Contact Curtis Acosta. <laughs> He's happily married to a really beautiful Chicana. So hey, hey, hey. <laughs> you should peep out class. You should keep, you know, like this. Because one night out of Eva Longoria's life, really, it's probably a week, right? Probably, you know, to get a benefit together, maybe more. You know, it's some hours. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. But one night of fundraising for her is probably class for five years. Or whomever. If you want to do that with homeboy Bill Gates, let's do it. But I don't think he's like, uh, he might not be at my talk on Saturday. <laughs> but I, I don't mind if he's surprised. He surprises me, right? So anyway, we're gonna try that. So keep your eyes peeled. I'm gonna bust this by Todd and see what happens. We'll do it for freedom you too. I don't wanna be like, you know, I wanna walk my talk. The reason why we're forming Chito is for that very reason, to start putting these struggles together, create a network of what's going on. Network of inspiration, a network of love, network of resiliency, and a network of folks and, and, and who have energy and, and, and innovation that can keep these kind of movements moving forward and, and also call out those haters. And for those of you that are interested in some of our, some of the stuff I've been talking about, we're all gonna roll out another institute, right? We're doing three-day institutes, right? And that's February 28th through March 2nd. Now these are kind of pricey right now, so you gotta get some money to fund you, right? And the reason why is because how we, do we raise money until Eva Longoria helps us out? Or, 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 <laughs> this, is, this, is where, this is where class is going to come from. So we're going to donate our time and hopefully suck off some institutional money from whoever for people to come out and get some of that knowledge and for us to build community and do what not so that we can give 15, 10, 15 Chicanitos in Tucson free college credit to keep Mexican-American studies alive. It's a great hustle, isn't it? But eventually, we don't want to put that on the backs of individuals. At least individuals like you and me who really think about our checking account when we let things get spit out of the ATM. Like, if you roll a little deeper than that, maybe you can uh, help us out. <laughs> but we should be holding people accountable. Corporations that rock a social justice mantra, right? That are about sustainability, that are about green, well, what about brown and black and red and yellow and blue and green? 
But we did green. <laughs> but let's, let's, let's put us all on that level of justice, too. And then here's some of my contact information if you want to get a hold of me. Or if you're a superintendent and, and, and you're not, and you're keeping it real and keeping it right, you can like, uh, maybe we can work together. <laughs> but anyway, I always forget to give you guys that information. And, then, and I'm going to close it up with this last thing. So do you guys need the, you got the, you got the way to get a hold of me? I'll wait a couple seconds here. Now listen, I will email back. It might take a little while. Okay? I got an eight-year-old and a two-year-old. In fact, I should put them in the next slide, just so you know. So you go, oh, they're cute. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to leave you like this. And I would say it's not only impossible to teach without courage to love, it's impossible to live without that. So you and I just had our moment together. I hope it was as good for you as it was for me. I want to thank you for your time. And I want, you to, I want to tell you that we can do this. And that one person does matter. One person always changes the world. So let's change it in the spirit of Elakesh, cross-cultural empathy, cross-ethnic empathy, and this idea that we are all one hint, one people. Let's really not just use lip service to that. Let's do that like we did in the classroom every day and recite it to ourselves or however you want to get in contact with that spirit. Keep it with you. I want to thank you so much for your time. It was an absolute honor. Good night. <laughs>